All right, so with that, I want to welcome our presenter, Amy Pascal, who is going to talk to us about energizing the lecture. I feel like it's the perfect time of the semester to talk about this when you feel like um, students are starting to fade um, with their attention spans, maybe because we are sometimes also fading with our attention mm -hmm. spans. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Amy, and I will tell you, for those of you who are online, you're free to use the chat to ask questions or put up your hand or whatever. There's not many of us here, so um, we can we can talk freely. So go ahead, Amy. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, so before we get started, I would just like to know from the folks who are here, um, just tell me your name and then also your discipline, because that will hold a lot of implications for the way that we talk about some of the strategies. Um, so, um, Libby, would you like to yeah. go first? Yeah. Sure. Uh, my name is Libby Coley, and I am a teaching lecturer here. Um, I so far I teach in general ed. I teach tackling a legal problem. Mm -hmm. In the future, I could imagine working within my discipline, which is social work. Okay, awesome. Social work. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, I am Robin DeRosa. My discipline originally is English, um, and now I do interdisciplinary studies. And I'm also going to share um, Sybil from the chat is in English and Humanities. And with that, I'll toss it to Martha. I am Martha Burtis, and um, I have taught in interdisciplinary studies at Plymouth State, but before that, most of what my teaching has been in um, digital studies. Awesome. Um, and so I teach over in the Health and Human Performance Academic Unit, um, and I teach a little bit in the Athletic Training Graduate Program, and then as well as the Allied Health Science and Exercise and Sport Physiology undergrad. Um, okay, so I'm going to screen share. Oops, did I minimize the thing that I actually need to share? There Far out of the way. Okay. There we go. Everybody good? Good. Good. I found it. Oh, yeah. And it's right there. Let's see it. Let's see. Okay. All right. Um, so first, I, I kind of want to give a little a little bit of a plug. Um, if anyone has has heard of or hasn't heard of the Lily Conference Network, um, that's essentially what really got me interested in essentially like the neuroscience of learning really got me hooked on um, just diving more into pedagogy and what that means and feeling like, you know, there's so many different ways to make what we do as educators exciting for not only our students, but for us too. Um, so the Lilly Conference Network is this conference network that um, has different locations that it, it holds conferences at annually throughout the year. Usually it's like in the same city, you know, annually, but there's about, I don't know, six to eight of them, I think, throughout the year. Um, and in order to present at a Lilly conference in your proposal, you have to identify three different pedagogical strategies or teaching methods, that, um, active engagement teaching methods that you're going to use during your presentation. So not a single presentation that you go to at a Lilly conference is gonna be literally just you sitting there and listening to a presenter. Um, it's all active engagement in some way, shape, or form. I have um, been to so many people. conferences where people are talking about active engagement, and, and they're not, just, yeah. I think I've even done that before. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. yeah, I know I have. You know. <laughs> um, yeah, but it's it's actually, it's just refreshing. Like, I go to a lot of conferences for my own discipline, and you just leave feeling drained. Mm -hmm. Like, yes, like, there's certain things that are exciting, but it's like, you just feel like you were hit by a bus by the end yeah. of the conference, and like, you need to recover. Lily conferences, I leave just feeling excited. Like I'm energized, I'm ready to go. Like I'm pumped to try new things. Um, I've made a lot of great personal and professional connections there. Um, so just awesome conference network. If you're if you're looking for something, you know, a little bit more focused on teaching, that um, that's going to be exciting. So and they have some cool locations too. You go to San Diego in February. Oh, I go to San Diego in February. Haven't been to that one yet. <laughs> um, and then. In addition, so this is a book um, where there's strategies in the book that that help to inform a lot of what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, but this book, Dynamic Lecturing, was authored by um, one of the, the essentially the directors of the Lilly Conference Network, Todd Zakrajek. 
um, who was also very instrumental in mentoring and helping me to develop the Center for Teaching and Learning at the last institution that I was at. Um, so again, just another way that the Lilly Conference Network has been just incredibly supportive, I think. So um, I just, I really like this book. It's a pretty easy read, you know, kind of, you can break it down by like the type of lecture that you're doing, depending on your discipline, what's most appropriate for you. Anyway, there's my little plug for that book as well. Um, okay, so the three methods that we're going to be talking about today can be used in person, can be used remotely, um, and then they it also can be used if you're teaching online and you're posting things asynchronously, and I'll talk a little bit about how we can translate it to that as well. I remember during COVID, I mm. kind of just started modifying stuff to, to make it engaging for students who were, you know, who were receiving stuff asynchronously. Um, and I, I think it helps them engage. I mean, I think like now we look back on COVID times and, you know, I mm. asked some of my students about like what their learning was like then and they're just like, oh, I've suppressed that. <laughs> it was, it was bad. Um, but anyway, the three different methods that we're going to be talking about today are embedding multiple choice questions throughout the lecture, the think pair share method, and then kinesthetic participation. Um, and then another thing that I'll be referring to throughout is, um, is Boone's taxonomy. Okay, so essentially this structure of identifying what level of learning or what level of knowledge we're asking of the students. Um, and depending on what technique we're using, we, sometimes the technique is a little bit more appropriate for a different level of understanding or a different level of knowledge than the other technique might be. So we'll be referring back to Bloom's taxonomy. All right, so for everybody to test your short term memory and to give an example of the first active engagement method, um, what conference series did Amy mention at the start of the presentation? And for those of you on Zoom, if you would like to drop your answer in the chat, that would be lovely. Just to humor me. <laughs> I looked at the chat, but I will say I already knew. I did know. <laughs> Well done. Good job, everybody. Lily <laughs> Conferences is correct. You were paying attention. Good work. <laughs> All right. Uh, so multiple choice questions throughout the lecture. So, so essentially, when we're thinking about structure, right? So when to implement. So depending on when you implement it, usually you're kind of going for a slightly different purpose. So at the beginning of the lecture, I'll use multiple choice questions at the beginning of the lecture for usually two reasons. One would be to, um, to revisit past information that applies to what we're doing today. So it's a really good way to kind of transition from what we did last class back into today, right? Get students to start like at the, the gears turning, remembering back to what we talked about last time. Um, but also if you had any kind of pre-class assignments, right? So like reading assignments, other things, um, to check for their understanding about, you know, like, did they pick up on the key points from the assignment, those kinds of things. Um, throughout the lecture, it's recommended um, every 15 to 20 minutes, really not going more than 20 minutes max without some kind of active engagement method. That's when a lot of students, the ones who actually have the longer attention spans, will kind of start to gloss over, you know, and, and not necessarily be, um, be as engaged. So, doing it at that point in time, so every 15 to 20 minutes, very often that also can correspond with like the different subsections of your lecture, you know, so if you're transitioning from one topic to the next, to the next. So at the end of any given topic, you can give multiple choice questions to backtrack and just say, okay, you know, like here's some questions. Did you understand some of the key takeaway points of, of what we just went over, right? Or like, okay, there was this term that we kept referring to, see if you actually, you know, if you can remember what the definition of that key term is, those kinds of things. Um, and then at the end of the lecture, usually the point of that is to under to check for understanding or to wrap up just certain key points, key terms, key concepts that you went over throughout that day. Um, so why it's important or why it's helpful for learning. So one, one thing I, I refer to often is this concept of long-term potentiality. <laughs> So essentially what that means, if we think about, if we think about the way we learn, right, and we think about our brain, which is comprised of, of, of 
buttload of neurons. Mm -hmm. but it's, it's not fine. the technical term. It is actually. It's pretty up. It's a, <laughs> no, it's what a weight, load. actually. <laughs> okay, a buttload of good. neurons. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, anyway, when you hear something new for the first time, two neurons will start to communicate with each other, right? And that's a new communication, one that hasn't been established before. And every time you hear that new thing or that new thing is reiterated, presented to you again, that connection between those two neurons will start to get stronger and more neurons will start to fire. And that connection will continue to get stronger and stronger and stronger. So as students study the material, right? So they bring it into the, what they're doing to prepare. Um, they hear about you as the instructor, talk about it in a different context that's going to start to strengthen that connection even more. So that's essentially the explanation behind why repetition is effective for learning certain things, right? Um, so essentially, it's it's a way to have key information repeated. Um, you could even repeat this information, you know, so if it's something that's super important for like a certain module of, of, your, um, of your class, I might ask the same multiple choice question in a slightly different way, right? Or I, I let me rephrase that. I might ask about the same knowledge point or try to get students to recall the same knowledge point by asking about it in a slightly different way. Um, when students hear about things in different contexts, it also makes that neural connection even stronger. So essentially our neurons are potentiating <laughs> as, they're, as they're getting stronger and building those stronger connections. And once that connection reaches a, certain, reaches a certain strength, that material is then stored in our longer term memory, right? It takes a while for it to be stored in our like absolute long term memory, um, but it, it becomes something that is beyond just recalling in a short period of time. Um, it also helps us maintain engagement and encourage participation of students. Um, the educator can assess student knowledge and understanding, and then the students can also monitor their own learning, right? So like you can tell them like, hey, you know, keep track of how you're doing with these, these multiple choice questions. You know, like this is similar to what I might ask you on an assessment, um, or like this is easier than what I might ask you on assessment. So, you know, if you find that you're really lost on a lot of these, like we need to talk about some strategies to, you know, to improve how you're doing your class. Um, so with Bloom's taxonomy, so the, the levels that we're really working at here are mostly at this bottom tier of remembering, okay? Um, multiple choice questioning, it's meant to be quick retrieval of information. It's meant to be basic, so like a definition, a concept, um, you know, kind of making the association between one thing and another, um, quick retrieval. Sometimes we can move into this, this understanding. So you might ask for like an implication of something. Um, but generally it's something that you don't want students to spend much more time or really need much more time than like maximum, maybe 30 seconds. Um, and we do have students with accommodations sometimes. So, you know, depending on my knowledge of that, I might, you know, give students up to a minute or so to think about it. Um, but really not getting at many of the higher levels there. It's really that lower level of remembering and understanding. Um, so then the next method is this, this concept of think, pair, share. So um, to illustrate that, I'd like for folks here to identify three methods for having students engage in multiple cho choice questioning during a lecture. So what I mean by that is, you know, um, earlier in the presentation, I had a slide up that had a question on it with an A, B, C, and D response, right? And I asked folks to volunteer your response, either by putting it in the chat or by verbally. Um, there's a ton of different ways that we can embed multiple choice questioning. So considering technology, response solicitation methods, et cetera. And then also think for remote, for in-person and or online instruction. So take one minute to think about it and write down your thoughts. After that minute, I'll ask you to share that with a partner um, and then, or I'll give you two minutes to share and discuss that with a partner and then we'll share it with the group. Because of the size of our group, I'll give everybody a minute to think and write it down and then I think we can all just talk about it. <laughs>
All right, and folks on Zoom, if you're thinking and writing, if you want to just give me a thumbs up when you're all set. <laughs> Two little thumbs. All right. Cool. Um, Okay, so folks on Zoom, so please feel free to either unmute or you can drop it in the chat, whatever works better for you. Um, but what what did you, oh, there's Sybil, hi. <laughs> um, but what did you come up with? And these might've been methods that you've used before or just things that you're thinking of. Um, well, I was thinking about response systems. So um, definitely like, Lots of faculty I know who are interested in things like clickers and systems that they can use to poll students about um, content during the lecture. Yep, yeah, a lot of different polling software out there. Yep. I was thinking of, I have a very quiet class right now at a specific time, and I use Google Voice to give them the opportunity to text me, uh, you know, off out of class hours. And so in class, sometimes I do a quick reflection and have them just text me on the Google Voice number and say, you know, can you rank where you are with our assignments or how you're doing with your mental health and all that. So I don't see why this couldn't, why I couldn't have on the board the multiple choice question on the screen or whatever, and then say, okay, will you guys text me your answer? Cause they just, they really don't like to be verbal. <laughs> so that would be one way. And then I can kind of still find out what they're all thinking. And maybe, the, maybe I can even ask for a reflection after the fact in the same text message. Totally. Yeah. Cause that can, you can get any kind of a response, right? They can do a number, a letter, yep. they can put yep. phrases. Yeah. Yep. Emojis. <laughs> yeah. Respond 100% in emojis, please. <laughs> Give me your message completely in, yeah. Yeah, Libby, what about you? Um, I was, so I use um, like Google, Microsoft Forms a lot with mm -hmm. my students. Um, and sometimes I'll do, um, I'll give them like, five to 15 minutes, depending on how long this, you know, kind of how much I'm trying to cover. Um, but if they have readings, uh, which isn't super often in TWP, um, I'll create like a questionnaire, um, you know, of multiple choice questions, including some multiple choice questions, some, you know, shorter long answer questions to review the content. Um, I also, um, have done I've used Jamboard one and I've used mm -hmm. um yeah like a, a polling question through Google Forms so live during class. Yeah like the, yeah. the poll right yeah. Google Forms. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um I had two both inspired by you because I have already learned some of this stuff from you. So um one that I really remember and liking was just that old school like at the beginning of class, they have A, B, C, and D written on cards or mm. colored cards, and they just hold them up yep. to vote. Um, but then I was also thinking about some of the stuff you'll talk about later about bodies, right, and moving bodies. So I was thinking about another fun thing. <laughs> I mean, and it would depend on your vibe with the class, but be like, you know, get as high as you can for A, <laughs> uh <-huh>. medium for <laughs> B, C, and then like as low as you can go for D. I'd be careful about like, I guess mm -hmm. some mobility and accessibility issues maybe, but yeah. um, but I do like the idea of also having this be kind of a fourth wall break, like mm. yeah, get them, you know, the blood running a little mm -hmm. bit in addition. <laughs> so both of those came from from you really even that gave me an idea too like so you can like any again if, if accessibility mobility is is an issue right you can tell them like okay like like a is or like you know like okay, right. for a mm -hmm. do this right. right like or like 
be do this like or make like, the shape of the letter right, yeah. however you need to <laughs> right. Right? like it, and it doesn't matter if you really know what it and, is and if you use it consistently but... that could be something you show them like beginning of the semester right so like right we're gonna do this regularly like here's the symbol for you know like right. here's the indication for a. <laughs> right <laughs> yeah really good at that yeah <laughs> um so just you know some methods and again so like if you're in person right so for in person i really like getting the students to do things like not so much on the device mm -hmm. um so i had one class that i taught um my prior institution where i gave them all colored index cards four colored index cards that said a b c d and i told them you know keep this with you for this class had them you know put, put them up um, you could also do so instead of A, B, C, D, have the choices be one, two, three, four, and then just have the students show with their fingers um, what their choices are. Anytime you have, you know, if you're doing a hybrid model, so you have people remotely, you can have them, you know, put it into the chat. Um, if there's, if you're doing a fully online class, or sorry, not fully online, but fully remote, you can either have students reply, send a direct message to you privately or publicly, depending on if you want students to see each other's answers or not. Mm -hmm. um, again, totally up to you. Was that you or somebody else who had the thing where the, it was like, there's like waterfall. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? Um, mm -hmm. No. It, it was about how you use the chat. And one of them is like, you ask the question, you just put it in when you know, but the other one, and one of them is called waterfall. And I think the other one has another, is when you wait and mm -hmm. you say, okay, you know, one, two, three, and that's when oh, they push that's it yeah, and they yeah. all come together. So come. Um, like, cool. Yeah. So I think people, like there are lots of ways to use chat mm -hmm. that, that are, are interesting. Totally. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Kahoot. Oh my gosh. I forgot about Kahoot. So good. Yeah. <laughs> so then like, right. So there's clickers, right. And then there's a lot of free stuff out there, right? So like Socratic is one, it's very similar to Poll Everywhere, um, but those are both free. You can do multiple choice questions on there. You can do a lot of times I'll do, and again, this is um, a little bit away from this specific strategy, but I'll use Poll Everywhere for like, I'll do a question prompt and it's like simple, very similar. It sounds to like having students text. I have an, a class who is very quiet, just really doesn't like being vocal but they do great with this. Mm -hmm. Like they do great when I give them an electronic means of communicating their thoughts. So, yeah. Um, so again, tons of different stuff out there, but those are just some ideas. Um, so thanks for sharing. That was everybody else had, had great things to add to that as well. Um, so why I think per share is, is helpful for learning, right? So participation and direct peer engagement. So I know I wasn't really able to demonstrate it exactly in this kind of format, um, but, um, generally what I'll do in class is I'll tell students, okay, turn, turn to the person next to you. Okay. Or I'll say, all right, you know, like next time, like turn to somebody who, you know, who you haven't. If you need it, just yeah. like cookies. Um, sorry, I don't have no online cookies. Um, <laughs> wow, um, you know, okay. Like turn to somebody who like, you know, you haven't, you haven't paired with before. Um, mm -hmm. And, and have them interact together, you know, have them share their thoughts, report out. Um, the think pair share is tough to do in either an asynchronous or a remote kind of situation. Um, but I also realized that I didn't talk about for the multiple choice questioning. So if we just back up a little bit. So if you're doing a lecture asynchronously and you're recording it, saving for later, um, I'll do the multiple choice. So I'll have it, you know, like I won't use the other software, but I'll have it just up on the slide and I'll give instructions in the recording. I'll say, okay, here's a multiple choice question. Um, I'm going to show you the answer in a few seconds, but what I'd like you to do right now is after I ask the question, pause the video, take a minute to think about it, write down what your response would be, and then play, pick it up mm -hmm. again. Um, you know, and I'll let them do that. And for those that aren't going to pause it, I'll usually just leave about like, mm -hmm. I don't know, five, 10 seconds or so of awkward silence um, <laughs> and then I'll say it again but I'll usually try to do something during my recorded lecture to really like bring them in and be like okay here's something I'd like you to do right now even though you know you're listening to this recording of my books. I bet um, most of them don't but they're still doing it you know in their heads yeah, right like, right they're reading the question they're, they're thinking like I'm thing, not gonna do that but know. they're still yeah. doing it right so totally. yeah so definitely a way to incorporate that one um and then some considerations for think pair share, right? So 
encourage students to interact with different peers. Um, it's ideal questions that were, it's ideal for questions that require critical thinking. So, you know, if you really have to think about like the why or having students come up with a rationale for their response, right? So you might have them, okay, write down two things, write down three things, talk to your partner. And when you're talking to your partner, share the things you wrote down, but also explain your rationale to your partner, right? Um, so it's ideal deal for stuff that does require a bit of critical thinking. And then you can also use it in conjunction with the multiple choice questions. Um, so like an example of how I do it, um, also, oops, I realized I might have been there, but anyway, um, I'm gonna go back to that lose taxonomy thing in a second. Um, but with multiple choice plus think pair share, so example of how I do it in my discipline. Um, so multiple choice questions might be something like this. So what is the primary function of the ACL, right? Which is if we go to here, that's down at this, this bottom piece that remember, so just um, recalling, you know, basic knowledge. Um, they would respond, we talk about it. What are the distal attachments of the hamstrings? Okay, again, another recall, right? Doesn't really take understanding, it's memorization. So they answer, we talk about it. And then the think pair share would be, how would activation of the hamstrings help reduce the risk of ACL mm -hmm. injury? So essentially, all right, what's the significance of your knowledge of those two things? but how can we actually now apply it, right? So the application piece, understanding and applying, we're now moving up a little bit into these taxonomy. Um, so with think pair share you're able to ask for slightly higher levels of thought and slightly higher levels of knowledge than we are with just the multiple choice alone. You're really talking too about the shape of a lecture being yeah. not just getting deeper into content, mm -hmm. but deeper into learning. Yes. And that's seriously beautiful. Like I think a lot of faculty, we think about making the comp the content more and more complex as the lecture mm -hmm. goes, mm -hmm. but we don't think, okay, how do we accompany the learning, you know, into mm -hmm. that deeper journey? So right. it's really nice. Yeah, and it's and that's usually like in reflections from students and in student evaluations, that's usually where they they comment on like, okay, that that method really really helped it stick for me. You know, they say like, I like when she would ask us questions in class and then have us talk about it with with other people. That would really help it stick. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, that's good feedback to receive. Um, so then the kinesthetic engagement piece, and again, I'm going to use an example from my discipline to illustrate it. So even if I'm continuing to build upon the other two things, right? So if we go back to here, that whole concept of the ACL and the hamstrings and how contraction of the hamstrings can help reduce ACL injury risk. So I might now actually walk them through a self palpation of their hamstrings, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna tell them, okay, you know, where's your hamstrings, back of your thigh, great, okay. So put your hand, you know, just behind your knee, all right, your hands right behind your knee. Now push your heel. So if you're, you're sitting with your knee bent at about a 90 degree angle, push your heel into the floor. Like you're trying to bunch up the floor underneath you. Okay. You should feel two tendons pop out behind your knee. Okay. Those are your hamstring tendons, right? So what did we, what, what's the action of the hamstrings? Hamstrings flex the knee. So you're essentially doing knee flexion against resistance. That's going to make those tendons pop out. Right. Okay. So now you can actually feel those tendons independently and you can follow them to their attachment points. All right, you followed them to their attachment points, right? One's on the fibula, one's on the medial side of the tibia. Okay, so what's going to happen to the tibia when they contract, right? What's it going to, or what's it going to do to the tibia, right? And they can actually feel it happen. Mm. Um, I'll lead them through guided palpation, again, like in a clinical anatomy class, very appropriate. <laughs> um, but what I really want to hear from other people is how we can apply that concept of kinesthetic engagement to other disciplines. So I think like my discipline is a little bit of like the literal application of kinesthetic engagement. Yes, literally having them feel their own bodies and feel their own bodies move and what's happening with their own bodies, right? Um, but I think there's a lot of different ways that we can ask students to demonstrate things or to demonstrate concepts um, using their bodies, right? In, in a less literal sense. Um, so why kinesthetic engagement is, is helpful for learning? And by kinesthetic engagement, that's really any kind of 
of directed body movement, right? So having the students move their body as they're processing information, okay? Um, so movement increases cerebral blood flow, which enhances cognitive processing. It stimulates multiple areas of the brain through multisensory processing. So what we know from science of learning is that when we receive information using more than one sense, right? So using as many of our senses as we can to engage with the material, that causes that long-term potentiation or that neural potentiation to be even stronger. So our brain cells, our neurons are going to fire in different ways, in stronger ways to help that material become part of our memory and essentially help it help us learn it. Um, so it integrates kinesthetic stimulus with auditory and visual, which is more of you know the standard auditory because you're talking to them and visual because they might see it on you know on a projector or something like that. Um, so considering your discipline, right? Here's another thing to share. What are some topics, concepts, or mechanisms that can be reinforced kinesthetically with body movement, locomotion, use of touch? and or materials that are readily available in a student's environment. So again, if this is remote, or if you're doing it asynchronous, you can guide them through this, right? You might say, okay, I'd like you to, you know, get up, get a pencil, um, get something round. So like a bouncy ball, you know, a lacrosse ball, a tennis ball, something round that you can roll, right? Like, so you can ask them to grab materials that most people would most likely have in their environment. Um, so think for about a minute or so about your own discipline. And then we're obviously not gonna do breakout rooms. We're gonna do one room. <laughs> um, we're know, gonna share this stuff. I'm so excited. I already have so many ideas. I'm like, okay. Okay, ready? Make us ready, go. a minute. But okay. well, we're gonna wait. We're taking a minute, right? Think of ideas. Yes. I'm gonna eat this. Sure. Are we going to have a All right. Everybody have a good amount of time you feel to um, think about um, some things that you might use to apply that for your discipline. Can I go first? <laughs> mm -hmm. um, the reason why I'm excited about this is that I'm really starting to struggle with memory issues, which I think is two things like mm -hmm. menopause. I have just said on the recording for all you people watching with posterity, um, but also stress. Destigmatize. Um, yes. Yeah. It's great. Actually, there's a lot of great things. Mm -hmm. But anyway, um, so I, I think Martha will attest like uh, my memory is really not very good. Um, and it's remarkable that I have memories of certain things that are so clear that I am realizing come from this mm. kinesthetic learning that you're talking about. One is that when I used to teach English, one of my favorite or literature, one of my favorite activities was what we call forced choices, where you maybe have a character in a novel and you'd say, if this character is evil, go over to the right side of the room. If this character is good, go over to the left side. And the idea was like, they weren't really good or evil. They were somewhere in the middle, but you force them to choose and they talk about it. But I can actually remember like so many comments that specific students made in those conversations when I can normally not even like remember the students I taught because my brain is like getting right. so foggy. Right. But I think somehow the move of moving our bodies and like being up and about, which was so unusual in the mm -hmm. class, 
really made that stuff stick. Um, and then the others in teaching and learning development, we just did an activity with faculty where they had to go out into the stacks and choose a book that represented their teaching. Mm -hmm. You know, or it was just an exercise to look mm -hmm. at the titles, right? Mm -hmm. And then they came back, but I can't actually remember anything else about that training session, mm -hmm. but I can tell you what the what the actual books were that my colleagues picked and why they said they picked them, which mm -hmm. I think had to do with, again, like holding a thing and moving and, you know, so yeah. very powerful, even though you'd be hard pressed to say what it was besides the body <laughs> movements right. that made the, mm -hmm. you know, any difference. So it was very cool. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's mine. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank yeah. you. Um, so given that I'm a clinical social worker specializing in trauma, um, my TWP topic is fitting, um, domestic and sexual violence in the U.S. And something that, um, when, especially when we're talking about, like, topic-specific things, um, we do readings about that, um, you know, I recognize that part of how I recognize that it's difficult content, you know, difficult topic to learn about and talk about and do something about. Um, I do um, body-based or mindfulness-based um, like uh, strategies. I'll introduce them and have them do the strategies. Um, mm. This isn't necessarily like helping them with any particular content, but helping them like manage their own affect and response um and like I think take it into wherever right but today I had we one group had created a video for a project so we watched the video we did some debrief before and after and then I led them in a grounding exercise um and I got good feedback from it and they were more engaged and it, hopefully this will help them yeah, in general, but also sometimes like throwing like, okay, you guys are falling asleep. Like, yeah. like how we do and like thumbs up, so, so down. And like, if I get glued eyes, I'm like, all right, we're going to like move. Mm -hmm. Like, so let me, let me do some stretching or just like freestyle stretch or like yeah. stand up. But you I know. think though, like you, you brought up a good point though. So by giving them, by giving them a, a prompt to mm -hmm. reflect on or think about mm -hmm. as they're doing that grounding mm -hmm. exercise, right? So like whether it's like a mindfulness piece, you know, deep breathing, mm -hmm. whatever it is, they're kinesthetically engaging their bodies as they're thinking about the thing. Right. So it, it is illustrating the same point. So right. like when you have stuff like, you know, like content like that, mm -hmm. it's like that you want them to be reflective mm -hmm. of. That's an excellent way, I think, to reinforce that because mm -hmm. you're also giving strategies which are therapeutic right because of the nature of the content right. right so yeah I think that's an excellent example yeah the first the thing I thought of immediately was I haven't done it for a while but I used to have my students I think I called it like the human replication of um an end citation in a research paper, yeah. and I would print off like on cardstock, the like the all the elements to a end citation, like last name of an author, first name, commas, mm -hmm. periods, and then I would hand out all the pieces, and and it was funny to watch them try to create, you know, at the front of the room, try to recreate. Like I'd say, okay, so we're, what what does it look like if we cite a website? So you know, recreate that, and they would often. You know, like you'd hear somebody screaming, "Where's who's who's a colon? Who's a colon?" <laughs> oh my gosh. And then I love that. That's yeah. really really so hard. And then to piggyback on so to piggyback on hard. Robin's like menopause thing, like there were so many guys that were a period. They were like the actual period, and then they they right. so much, you know, like overlap between body parts and citations. I had no <laughs> idea, you know, colons right. and periods and all sorts of things. <laughs> yeah, really, yeah, what's that about? They really enjoyed. I mean, it was, I don't know if they remembered because they're standing there holding their thing. And I think they kind of understood what I was trying to get at, but if nothing else, it was like the wackiest way to try to uh, get them to remember citations. So I, but it was very, but gonna, remember that the order matters. Yeah. 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 Right. Like yeah. they're going to remember that like, oh yeah, like we did this because like right. it matters. Yeah. 
if you put and the a comma chances, versus a period. Right. The chances of remembering some pieces you can tell would be pretty high. Mm -hmm. Whereas the chances of remembering that disembodied on a piece of paper right. are literally zero. Yes. Like even I have to look them yeah, up. Yeah, you know? I love that right? so much. So so I really struggle so. every year oh with first year students specifically yeah. like trying to get them to understand format for citations and references. Yeah. Yep. Wow, thank oh, you so much. Yeah, yeah. It's, it, it ends up being very chaotic, but if they get something out of it, you know, and that's worth it. So totally. Um, I'll just offer one that I don't, it's a little bit different, but I think I could see how it, it could be used also in different disciplines. Um it was actually the very first semester I was ever teaching. I was teaching a digital storytelling class and it was a face-to-face -face class, and we would meet in the evenings once a week for three hours, which is like deadly. And um, towards the end of the semester, like students were still coming to class, but I noticed they were like, they're just, everybody would just get tired. It's hard to get them to really engage. And I decided to kind of get them moving. And I did this assignment where I gave them like pictures of famous paintings and I sent them out like I gave, they were in groups and each group would get like a, an envelope with like, I think three paintings in it. And then I'd send them out on campus and they had to recreate, they had to take a picture of themselves recreating that image using whatever they could find on campus, like using themselves and their bodies. And then like whatever props they could locate on campus. And I mean, from a storytelling perspective, it was a really good exercise because it meant they had to really think about detail and think about like what's happening in this picture and like what's the meaning that's trying to be conveyed and like it's it's a and about kind of like objects in relationship to each other and people in relationship to objects so that was how I justified it as like a meaningful assignment but it also just really did get them like up and moving and engaging with each other at a time of day and a time in the semester when they were kind of starting to check out but I was thinking it would be kind of interesting to take that assignment and apply it to other disciplines, like in the sciences, if you were looking at like scientific diagrams or something, things you have to remember, but mm -hmm. give them the assignment of like, okay, recreate this using like objects you can find in the building and your own bodies or stuff that you have and take a picture of it um, as a way to kind of reinforce the ideas in physical space. Totally. Done. Absolutely. Yeah, that's awesome. I used to do that with the brachial plexus in human anatomy. It has, oh like, it's, the, it's the nerve network that comes ah. out of your neck. Yeah. And like feeds your upper extremity, yeah. but I'd have them basically make it out of different kinds of materials. Oh. Then they eventually had to draw it, but you know, the more they do with different materials. Right. Yeah. So cool. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks so much, everybody. That was awesome. It was great. Um, yeah. So a ton of different ways to get, to get students to engage kinesthetically, right? And again, like sometimes, Libby, you mentioned this too, like you look at everybody and everyone's just kind of like unresponsive, right? <laughs> just like, oh God, okay. Um, so just having them, literally just having them move, right? Mm -hmm. I'll tell my students to be like, okay, like everybody needs to move, stand up and I'll guide them through like a few stretches, yeah. right? Like just have them like mm -hmm. move their neck around, like, you know, shoulders, do some of these. Mm -hmm. Sometimes um, with my grad students, I have them choose. I'm like, all right, push ups, body weight, squats. <laughs> lunges, plank hold. I'm like, pick one, 30 seconds, ready, go. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, just literally just having them get up and move their bodies. Like it's amazing just how much they're like, oh, okay, mm -hmm. right, I'm, I'm good now. Mm -hmm. So pretty cool. Um, yeah, so anyway, let's see how we go. We're pretty good on time. Um, so again, those those three techniques, right? So multiple choice questioning throughout, think, pair, share, kinesthetic engagement. Um, I think just, just one thing to, to keep in mind is just be intentional about the level of knowledge that you're asking from the students. So think about like what, what level is your class, right? And what, what level, where are the students at? So if it's information that you're just presenting maybe for the first time, that lower level of Bloom's taxonomy of, you know, just remembering or calling facts is probably going to be most appropriate, um, as opposed to jumping to the more advanced stuff that you might expect them to be able to do for understanding, applying, evaluating. That happens later on 
once they've remembered the basics, the foundation, and they've started to understand how to apply it, right? So again, if you're doing more of like a summative evaluation towards the end of the semester, those higher level um, uh, higher level direction might be a little bit more appropriate for what you're doing. But I think in order for it to be effective and for the students to not get discouraged by it, it's just really important to make sure that you're um, just being purposeful with what exactly you're asking them to do, right? Because um, I know I've had some of these like think, pair, share, fails, I'll call them, where like, you know, I ask them to write something down, talk with each other, and then I'm going around, I'm kind of listening, and like everyone's just like, I don't know, like, mm. I don't understand what she's asking. <laughs> like, I don't know, didn't we learn this thing last time? And and I and I realized I'm like, okay, I'm like, yo, that was that was not mm. the right way to go about that, you know. And I backtracked. I'm like, okay, you know what? Let's regroup. Let me rephrase that. Okay, here's a different way, mm. right? And it was the same concept. But they did a lot better with it just coming down a level of groups. That's all. Right. Yeah, it seems like the multiple choice questions to are so much are so valuable for the teacher to yeah. test less. Do you remember this? And more, did I make sense when I said this? Yes. Right. Like, so um, where are we at? Yeah. Yeah. And so that then you kind of get the sense of like what things as you're going along do you need to rephrase and I tend to say most things in two different ways mm -hmm. and usually that's enough but then yeah. for certain things you probably need three or four different kinds of examples and restatements and so I bet that could really tell you yeah what things can you you know tell you the pacing for your and, lecture yeah and sometimes too you know like with those multiple choice questions I'll notice like okay wow the majority of students answered wrong but they all right. chose the same incorrect right. answer right mm -hmm. so then I'll say that I'll be like okay you know like here's the, the correct answer yeah. here's what the vast majority of you selected why uh, you know like and i'll ask i'll be like that i said like that's an indication that i haven't been explaining right. things well or i've been misleading so can someone please like just tell me why what what's your rationale right like what's the connection that you're making for that response and usually i'll get one or two brave people right who will and then i'm like oh okay let's go back and let's clarify i think um, that might also be when you're thinking about introducing these techniques to students mm -hmm. i think about um how clearly for some students and I don't think with anybody in either of these rooms, Zoom or here, would be in this category. But you could imagine some professors using these techniques in ways that would give students lots of anxiety, right? Like, mm -hmm. I don't want to show that I'm the only one in right. chat who just said the wrong answer. Right. But if you present it more as this helps me shape the lecture. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm kind of testing myself. Right. You know? Like this helps me gauge how I'm doing with teaching you the yeah. material. Yeah. Like yeah. especially on those multiple choice ones, I think that's that's really effective. And I think you have to model that by mm -hmm. showing them how you yeah. regroup think, after yeah. they provide their answers, right. right? I think the students really appreciate yeah. understanding like the purpose yeah. behind why you're teaching a certain way as yeah. well. Like, you know, I think that kind of helps to humanize things a bit right because yeah. they're like oh yeah of course I want to help you you know like, <laughs> it's not just a quiz, if you're, you're just right? asking me a question yeah. about like this like boring thing like no but right. like oh it matters to you yeah. that I do this thing for yeah. you okay right. <laughs> and it distinguishes it from what they're automatically thinking yeah. which is like you're quizzing me right, right. which right. is really yeah. not remotely what you're doing with yeah. these kinds of things so totally I really I love how these all work together too yeah so um, this is just a list of some some helpful resources. A lot of these are books that um, that I found to be really useful. A lot of them are recommendations either from Lily conferences um, or from you know other teaching best practices <laughs> types of types of conferences and sessions. Um, but that is it. Thank so, you, Sybil. We see your lovely note. Glad you could join us. Awesome. Um, Thank you, Sybil. And I will stop the recording, and uh, then anyone's free to chat for a minute if you want. I will stop the recording when I can. There we go. I did. <laughs> I. It is not stopping. Now it is.